Well, good morning, church family. So good to see you all in church this morning. Um, if you still have your Bible, please make sure it's open to Isaiah chapter 6. If you got to church without one, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you, so just grab that out and turn to Isaiah chapter 6. You can follow along in a moment. This is now our second installment in our series on doctrine. And if you were here last week, you'll know two things. The first one is that last week we addressed the question, what is the Bible, right? The doctrine of Scripture. The second thing that you'll know from last week is that I preached entirely too long. Is that an amen that I heard? Anyway, look, I'm committed this week to try to keep it under 40 minutes, but we'll see. Um, and, you know, the, the Bills... Bengals game doesn't even start till three, so we should be okay. Last week, what is the Bible? This week, we're looking at the question, who is God? Or if you're a fancy theological type, the question is around the doctrine of God. On the one hand, I can't imagine a more unapproachable question. Can you imagine a more grandiose undertaking than to set out in 40 minutes or so the nature and the character of God. Well, when I was thinking about this this week, it struck me that this would be something akin to an amoeba trying to explain quantum physics, right? So, so high is God above us, so great is he, that it's almost mission impossible from one perspective. So I've struggled all week. I struggled all week with what should we talk about when we ask the question, who is God? It's beyond us on the one hand. And yet theologians have actually given their lives now for millennia to answering this question. And they've come up with some very helpful words and categories. Some of these you might be aware of. Let me just run through some of them and you can kind of nod encouragingly if you know them or you can shake your head and we can talk afterwards if you don't. Have you heard of the three omnis, right? In reference to God, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Have you ever heard those before in describing God? Or perhaps when you've delved into the theology around God, you've heard of words like the Holy Trinity. Are you familiar with Trinity? As Christians, we are not polytheists. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are indivisible, of one substance, of one being. Maybe you've heard, if you follow Dr. Wyatt Graham's social media feed, you probably heard words like um, simplicity, divine simplicity, or impassibility, or immutability. Wyatt, did I get those right? Yeah. But what we're undertaking here this morning is not a theological lecture. It's a sermon. And so I thought we would focus our attention on three attributes of God that are deeply and profoundly applicable to our everyday life. Sort of the First things that someone on Brant Street might think about when they ask the question, who is God? Right? I thought we would deal with those. And so the three that we're going to look at this morning, first, God exists. Second, God is good. And third, God is holy. Narrowed it down to those three truths. It is true on the one hand that this question almost seems unapproachable when we think about who is God. And yet on the other hand, in Scripture, we are met with the God who wants to be known. Who so wants to be known that he has ordered a cosmos and developed an entire universe so that everything points to his existence and reveals aspects of his character. So much so does he want to be known. The God who wants to be known so deeply and profoundly that he has given us his word, that we might know him. The God who so deeply wants to be known that he comes to us 
veiled in human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And so while on the one hand it may be true that we tremble under the question, who is God? On the other hand, the good news of the gospel is that God is not aloof or disconnected. He doesn't fully and ultimately hide or or shield himself from our knowledge. But instead, and this is a word we talked about last week, he reveals himself to us. We're going to get to these three attributes in just a moment, but we can't move too quickly off this point because it's important. God reveals himself to us. It's not the case that as Christians we come up with ideas or thoughts about God. So when we come to God's revelation to us in the scriptures, for example, it's not just the pious musings of people trying to figure out what God is like. You know, looking up at the stars and wondering, perhaps God is like this or perhaps God is like that. But as Christians, we believe that God comes to us and reveals himself to us. Well, that's a big difference. Because the problem is, we have limited capacity as human beings. And so if we try to figure out a God left to our own devices, if we try to come up with a God, we will end up creating a God who looks just like us. Let let me say this a different way, because you might be thinking, "How, how do I know if I'm doing this? If the God that you believe in would never do anything that you wouldn't do, if the God that you believe in would never require anything that you would never require, then that is a God of your own fashioning and of your own design. That's not the God who reveals himself to us in nature, in Scripture, and in Jesus Christ. Okay? God reveals himself to us. Let's deal with the first attribute of God. God exists. Still have your Bibles open. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I actually liked when Christina said the page number, so I'll tell you what page number it's on. Because I know we have some who are new to the Bible. Um, if you're in the, the Bible, it's, you've got from the seat under you, it's on page 939. 939. Romans chapter 1. God exists. Okay. This is very fascinating when we were diving into this, this week in study. Because what, what I realized is that um, Scripture itself comes at this question of the existence of God in a counterintuitive way that's actually opposite to the way that we approach it. As Christian men and women, when we begin conversations with other people, perhaps people who are atheist or agnostic, we think that we need to convince them of the existence of God. But in fact, in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, the Bible tells us, God has revealed to us that knowing the existence of God is the default setting for all of humanity. That's actually the the factory settings, if you will, for every human person who's ever lived. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Oh gosh, I should have kept my finger in there. Chapter 1, verse 19, Paul writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Paul comes at this question of the existence of God in the opposite direction from what we do. He says, every single person is already possessed with enough information that they already know God. Paul goes even further. He says it's not only that people come with this default setting of knowing about the existence of God, but they even know his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature. Now, friends, 
Let's pause on this point for a moment. It means that if you're sitting here this morning and you have even the vaguest belief in God, that's because He has granted that to you. And so that's cause for at least two things. Christian people ought to be among the most grateful people in the world. Because we look at our fundamental belief in God and we recognize this is not something that I earned, that I chose. This is something that God in His grace has granted to me and given to me. All people have a knowledge of God, even of His eternal attributes. So it ought to make us thankful. The second thing is it ought to make us gracious. When we're dealing with other people who have suppressed the knowledge of God, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, we ought to come to them with humility and mercy, not because we are smarter than them and we figured out the existence of God and we understand how this all works and, you know, they need to come around. And no, no, that's not the perspective of a Christian man or woman at all. Christian men and women are grateful and they're gracious. So you might hear this first point that we're making under the existence of God, that every single person has the default setting of believing and knowing God. You might recoil from that. You might think up in your mind about some counter-arguments. But I want you just to step back for a moment and, and let's, let's camp on this thought. Paul's argument in Romans chapter 1 is that there is sufficient evidence to the nature and the existence of God in the cosmos that every single person is without excuse and knows him. Okay, that's what he's saying. What this means is, if you and I look at the natural world and at the natural order, we ought to be able to figure out and deduce that there is a God. Well, one of the ways that I've approached this, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again, is to, to begin talking to people and show them that the existence of a creator, intelligent God, designer and sustainer, makes the most sense of the most evidence when we look out at the world. Okay? First of all, nothing comes from nothing, so there had to be an original, an original source. When you see anything in the created world, you're like, well, I don't know, like nothing comes from nothing, so there must be a God that sort of makes the most sense of the most evidence. Or perhaps even if you remember back to grade 12 physics, the law of entropy. Do you guys remember the law of entropy? The law of entropy says this. It says that everything in the universe moves to maximum chaos and disorder when left unattended. So without external intervention, Every single thing rots, decays, and disintegrates and moves to maximum disorder and chaos. Well, that's not only a, a scientific principle in physics, that's also just something that you know intuitively. If I were to leave my car out in the middle of a farmer's field for 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, that car that operates with a working combustion engine and windows that roll up and down would disintegrate into iron molecules that would return to the water table and wash out Lake Ontario and out to the sea, right? Left alone, it moves to maximum chaos and disorder. It requires external intervention to take chaos and disorder and to create order. There's no amount of time where random iron molecules from the water table would, over 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10 billion years, come together and form a working internal combustion engine. It requires an external source of intelligence to exert influence upon those elements to create order out of chaos. So, when you look at a universe that works, when you look at the elegance and the intricacy of a little baby, 
I think, well, there's just no way that that happened by chance, right? There has to be a God. And so it's thoughts like that that actually expose the fact that the knowledge of God has been given to every single person. All world religions believe in a God. I think most people, even those who are not religious, would have some deep conviction that there is a energy source or spirit or something, right? It's, it's written deep on the heart of humanity. I would even suggest that this universal knowledge of the existence of God is seen any time any person finds himself in a scrape. You've heard the old adage that there are no atheists in foxholes. When you find yourself at the end of your rope, no matter how much atheism or agnosticism you've professed your entire life, it becomes the default setting for you to call out to a God. Is that true? Or maybe for your children or for those whom you love. Because deep in your heart you have this gnawing belief that there is a God. Or when tragedy befalls. You know, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was watching football and I saw when DeMar Hamlin was hit. Did you guys see that? And he dropped to the ground and everyone along with him, all of our hearts stopped for a moment. He had stopped for a lot more. And what was the response? Do you remember? Why, players from both teams and from both benches gathered around him and joined in prayer. People watching the game from all over North America were sitting in their homes or in their pubs or wherever they were watching, and they called out to God. Because it's the default setting of the human being that God has hardwired into us that we all know that God exists. Well, that's how Scripture approaches this question of the existence of God. So then you might be thinking, yeah, but what about people who deny that existence, right? What about people who go their entire life and they claim to be atheists, they say, I refuse to accept the existence of God. What about them, Argy? Surely they're an exception. Well, let's look back to Romans chapter 1. Begin back at verse 18. Remember, Paul here is building the case for the fact that the knowledge of the existence of God is universal across all of humanity, and therefore people are without excuse. Verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness do what? Suppress the truth. Okay? So verse 18, Paul's saying that for many different reasons, people suppress this truth of the existence of God. When you see someone who denies that God exists, they do not actually fundamentally believe that God doesn't exist. Paul's saying they're actually working against their God-given default setting of belief in the existence of God. They're suppressing it. They're holding it down. Well, for many, many different reasons, possibly. Some people suppress the belief in the existence of God because they know that if God exists, then he holds the rights and the prerogatives to tell them how to live. They don't want that. So Romans 18, Paul says, some people suppress that truth. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Verse 21, Paul says, people who deny the existence of God, they're not only suppressing the truth, they're doing it because their hearts have become darkened and foolish. He even goes further and he tells us 
How is it that a heart can become darkened and foolish? He says it's because they've given themselves over to wrong desires and futile thinking. So wrong desires, misplaced affections, and futile thinking. Well, that will darken your heart and lead you to foolishness and lead you to suppress the truth of the existence of God. Verse 23, he says that the result of this is that they will go on worshiping the created over the creator. Now, if you think about people that you might know, or maybe to some degrees even yourself, you've said, well, there are different times in my life where I've suppressed the knowledge of God. You'll often see that lived out in just this way. People suppress the knowledge of God, and what they do is they turn to worshiping the created over the creator. I've never been to Florence, Italy. Has anyone been to Florence? Yeah, a few. Have you seen the statue David? Yeah, I've never seen it. I, it's something I really want to do. Apparently, it's something to behold. Five point something meters tall. It's a masterpiece of workmanship and perspective and, and just carving out of marble. It's, it's awesome to behold. I've never seen it in person, but I've Googled it. Right, and it looks pretty impressive. Can you imagine standing under the shadow of the statue of David and being awestruck by its beauty and its majesty and its workmanship and its craftsmanship and its just very presence? But then stopping there? Well, there would be something wrong with that, wouldn't there? It would only be natural and appropriate to stand in the glory of this beautiful created statue and then marvel at the genius of the man who carved it. And Paul's logic here is that it is the very definition of foolishness when we observe the glory of the creation and worship it instead of pressing further to the existence and the glory of the God who created it. It's the very definition of biblical foolishness, Paul says. And foolishness, it's no light matter in Scripture. You know, when we think of foolishness, we maybe think of the Three Stooges or something silly and entertaining. But Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that Foolishness brings the very wrath of God from heaven against such people. It's through darkened hearts, foolish minds, worshiping the created over the creator that human beings engage in ultimate foolishness. And so they have the wrath of God visited upon them. Well, Paul goes on in Romans chapter 1 to outline the signs of that wrath. And friends, you can read that yourself this afternoon before the game starts at 3. But I think you would conclude that those signs are seen all around us today. And that they're on the rise very quickly. One of the things that marks our world today is the suppression of the truth, of the knowledge of God. But make no mistake, it's a suppression of what people already know. So you might be thinking this morning, before we move on to our second point, that God is good, you might be thinking, well, where do I stand on this issue of the existence of God? Do I believe this? Or have I, like Romans chapter 1, come up with what I think are clever ways to work around the existence of God, but they are in fact foolishness? Foolishness. 
all of Scripture assumes that God exists. This existence of God makes the most sense of the most evidence in a created order. All of Scripture assumes that God exists. The Bible actually begins with this assumption in Genesis chapter 1. You don't need to flip there. You might know it. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The existence of God was a starting point of assumption for all biblical truth. You know, Scripture and Christian faith asserts that God exists and that this is the default or factory setting for all of humanity, that any denial is in fact rebellion against what you know to be true. God exists. Second point, second attribute of God. God is good. Okay, so some world religions imagine that a God exists or has a God that, that even creates order. But their gods are capricious. Their gods are set against people. In Scripture, we find out that God not only exists, but that the God that we know and trust and believe in is fundamentally good. In Luke chapter 18, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And do you remember what the rich young ruler called Jesus in Luke chapter 18? Good teacher. And how did Jesus respond? Luke chapter 18, verse 19. Jesus said this truth that, first of all, exposed the rich young ruler's you know, um, salesmanship or whatever, like a used car salesman. But it also showed us a truth about God. Jesus in Luke chapter 18, verse 19, said to the rich young ruler, there is no one good except God alone. And so when we think about God and his goodness as one of his attributes, what we're saying is that God is the sole standard for goodness. Now, Christian man or woman, this actually brings a great deal of peace to your day-to-day life. We live in a world where values are being shed off, where institutions are being um, exploded and deconstructed. And so much of our life in our world is subject to relativism. We feel like our lives have become unmoored and are adrift at sea. What is good? Who's to say? How can you know? Well, a Christian man or woman roots it in this simple truth. God and God alone is the standard for goodness. And because he's good, His word to us is best for human flourishing and thriving. We as Christians believe that God exists. We believe that he's good. And so we believe that when God instructs something to people, it's not because he's withholding anything good. It's not because he's being capricious or mean. It's in fact out of his love for us and his goodness to us. He is good. He knows what's best. And he ordains what is right. God is the standard of goodness. He's also the source of goodness. In James chapter 1, verse 17, this is one of my favorite memory verses. James writes and refers to God as, he says this, okay? He says, Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father of lights, from God. And then he says, in him there's neither variableness nor shadow of changing. So God is not only the standard of goodness, he's also the source of goodness. Now what that means for us today is that when you take stock of your life and you go through all of the things for which you're grateful Anything that is good in your life, it comes from your heavenly Father. It comes from God. James says that God is so, not only the source of goodness, but he says that there's no variableness or shadow of changing in him. What James is saying is that God is unwaveringly good to his children. 
He's the source of all goodness. He doesn't wake up one day on the wrong side of the bed and decide to be miserable. He's good. And so this, again, shapes a heart of gratitude. If we truly believe that God is nothing but good, and that every good thing in our life comes from God, then it ought to make us humble. You, know, you might think, okay, so many things in my life are graces, they're from God, the good family that I was born into, um, I have no control over that. But there surely are a lot of things that I've actually earned myself, and so those good things came to me because of my conscientiousness or my hard work. Well, I kind of used to think that. But as I've aged, I've come to realize that even the things that I think that I've earned, I've only earned because God has given me the ability, the will, the perseverance, and the strength to do them. And so ultimately, God being good means that he's not only the standard of goodness, he's the source of all goodness in my life. So, so far, God exists, and he's good. Um, but we can't talk about the goodness of God without the necessary question coming up. You know the one. If God is good, then why do bad things happen? Right? Isn't that the, isn't that the question that always comes up? Why suffering? Well, here is where the attribute of God's goodness overlaps with another attribute that's sort of a, a category in the goodness bucket of God's sovereignty. Okay, when we say as Christians that God is good, what we're saying is that he is sovereign and rules and reigns over everything. And we need to anchor that one down before we enter into that question. If God is good, why do bad things happen? Why do we suffer? Well, there are many different answers to that question. I just want to touch on two. The first possibility is that bad things happen to people and at a macro level in society and in the world because of our sin and our own disobedience. That's, that's one answer. Okay? To say it another way, a friend of mine said this to me. <laughs> I was in a bad situation. He said, um, everything in your life happens for a reason. And sometimes the reason is that you're stupid and make bad decisions. Right? Surely you can look at some situations where you found yourself in pain or suffering, you say, man, I really brought that one upon myself. And so in one sense, maybe suffering happens because it's natural consequences for sin, disobedience, or bad decisions. But even in that category, those moments of suffering or pain are maybe natural consequences, but maybe they're actually God's loving goodness to us. Because we're heading down a path of sinful self-destruction. And so God causes us and allows us to experience the pain and the suffering so that we will course correct and change and alter our path. So maybe bad things happen in the first place because God in his severe mercy loves you too much to leave you to sin and hell, and death, and destruction. That's one. Now, you want to be really, really, really careful. This is, a, this is a good place to start when you're faced with your own suffering, right? It's a good place to start your inventory. Why are things bad right now? Why am I suffering right now? It's a good question to ask yourself. Is there sin? Is there disobedience? Are there things that I need to change? You want to be really, really cautious prescribing that to another person. See, that's what Job's friends did, right? Job found himself in a really, really bad situation. His friends came along and they said, well, of course you're in a bad situation. It's because of the sin in your life. So unhelpful. 
That's where we get this derogatory term, Job's comforter, because all you're doing to another person is heaping guilt on top of their bad situation and compounding their suffering now with guilt. Surely there's a place to call out other people in love where there's deep relationship that they might repent. But just be really cautious with that one when you're dealing with other people. So think for a moment about your own self. Bad things are happening. God is good. It's happening because you've made a horrible decision. You've lived out of sin and disobedience, and so this bad thing has come upon you. Let me encourage you with this truth from Scripture. God's goodness and his purposes are never handcuffed by your folly. God can even take your sin, your disobedience, your worst moments and worst decisions that have led to pain, and he can redeem them for good. Because he is good. And his plans and his thoughts for all of his children are good. Look, maybe you can think about the worst decision you ever made in your life. And you can see that although it was a horrible decision at the time, shaped by sin, shaped by disobedience, it's actually worked out to be a blessing in the end. That's not because you're clever or smart. That's because God is good. And so he has taken your folly and your bad decisions and he has redeemed them for good. Maybe it's good in and of itself. Maybe you would say it was good because now I have a life experience that I can share with others who are suffering as well. Such is the goodness of God, even in the face of suffering. Well, another possibility for why bad things happen if God is good is captured in Romans chapter 8 verse 28 and that is that God is so good that at all times he is working all things for your good and for his glory this is something that has to be received by faith I know from personal life experience and from being your pastor for 18 years that the question, why do bad things happen when God is good, is not an abstract question that happens out in the ether. It's a question that's cried out in the crucible of suffering. In the moment of great brokenness. And in those moments, I know that I'm asking the question, Where is God? How could he allow such suffering? But when I'm really honest with myself, I know that even if he were to answer that question, it's not an answer that I want. It's comfort and a person. And that's what we are assured with. This is how we hold together the goodness of God and the suffering in our lives. Not that God gives us an answer to the question of why we're suffering in the moment, but that he gives us himself. I mentioned Job a moment ago, and I don't want to go into the whole story, but Job goes through a whole lifetime of suffering, brought about by none of his own doing, right? It just, it just befalls him, and everything falls apart. His family, his children die, he gets sick, he loses his business, um, he's broken, And he goes through this entire journey where his friends give him really, really bad advice. And then he reaches the end of his rope and he pumps his fist in the air and he cries out to God, how could you let this happen to me? I thought you were good. And you know what God doesn't do? He doesn't look at Job and say, well, Job, here are the bullet-pointed five reasons why I'm allowing this to happen to you. Because he knows that it isn't understanding that Job needs. It's comfort. And so God's answer to Job in the suffering is, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Who are you to give me counsel? See, this is how God's goodness is unfolded in the face of our suffering. Job then repents and bows his heart before the Lord, and he says that he had overstepped his bounds with God. God. 
But here was Job's conclusion. Job said, Up until now, I had heard about you with the hearing of my ears. But now I see you with my eyes. And so, friend, while there might not be an easy answer to why there is still suffering in your life and in the world when God is good, what there is is something better. The assurance that in and through your suffering and your pain, you will come to know God. You will come to know him in ways that you could never have known him if everything was rosy and perfect. From the hearing with your ears to seeing with your eyes. Do you hear that? And so the Christian man or woman lives out of the goodness of God, even in the face of hardship and suffering. We hold on to it. We cling to it. We live as though it's true. When we find ourselves in suffering, we fight against that tendency to ask the question, where is God in this? Why is this happening? Instead, we ask the question, what ought I to be learning from this about God? What have I learned about his character? What have I come to know relationally about him in this suffering? And then none of your suffering will be wasted. Because it's in suffering that you come to know the God who suffered with you and for you in Jesus. And you hold fast to this truth that God is the standard for goodness and the source of goodness, that he only brings good things to his children, even and especially when it doesn't seem so. Because his primary concern is not your comfort. It is to conform you into the image of Christ. God is good. And yet we suffer. And so that's our posture, is to receive from God everything as good. So God exists, God is good, and the last one, God is holy. Okay, this is our last point. This is our passage that Christina read this morning from Isaiah 6. So flip over there, page 571. When Isaiah sees this vision of the Lord in Theophany, um, Look to verses 3 to 4. He sees seraphim, angels, and they are crying out and they are singing. In verse 3, what are they singing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the very name of the God of Israel, Yahweh. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holiness is the central attribute of the Lord our God. Whenever you see in, in, in Hebrew and in Greek, there are no exclamation points. And so strength is given to a statement through repetition. Three times repeating, holy, holy. Holy, it's growing exponentially as the angels, the seraphim, are declaring it. And God's holiness refers to the fact that he is other and apart from his creation. It also refers to the fact that he is pure in his actions and righteous in his actions. This truth of the holiness of God is woven throughout the entirety of Scripture. Back when God revealed his name to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, God declared to Moses, I am that I am. And so God says, my very name is, I do what I say I'm going to do. That's my name. I do what I will. Think about that. It's precisely that that makes God holy and different from us. For all of us, there is a gap between what we think and what we do. 
There's a gap between what we say we value and how we actually live out our values. There's even a gap of integrity. But with God, there is no gap. He says to Moses, if you want to know my name, watch what I do, because there's perfect integrity between what I do and who I am. God is holy. We are not. In verse 5, Isaiah responds to the holiness of God revealed to him. And he responds by saying, Oh, hi, God. Nice to see you. No. He responds and says, God, great to see you, buddy, old pal. Right? No, 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 no. He trembles under it. He says in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Anytime God appears in glory in theophany in Scripture, this is the consistent response of people who see him in visions or revealed as the angel of the Lord. They are undone. Because it's in the presence of a holy God that we're confronted with our own sin. It's when we behold the holy majesty of the Lord God of hosts, that we realize that we're not holy. Like Isaiah, woe to me, right? He's saying literally in Hebrew, I am undone. I'm falling apart. I'm disintegrating. In the presence of a holy God, I can't even stand because I'm aware of my sin. I'm aware of my unclean lips. And the angel of the Lord takes a coal from the altar and places it on Isaiah's lips and sears his lips and says, your sins have now been atoned for. That's what's necessary for us as humans in the presence of a holy God, to have our sins atoned for. Well, for Isaiah, it took the form of an atonement that seared his flesh. But for you and for me, It takes the form of an atonement in the flesh of the Son of God. His flesh was beaten and bruised for our iniquity and for our sin so that we can stand like Isaiah before the presence of a holy God with all of our sin atoned for and washed away forever. These three attributes of God, his existence, his goodness, and his holiness, lead us to this conclusion. What are we going to do with it? I'm well aware that this sermon series is different than any that we've ever preached at St. George's, right? We're preaching deeply and theologically. And I know that for some of you who are eggheads like me, you love it. But I'm also aware that for some of you, you're sitting there thinking, man, I don't know, a little too deep, RD. I'm aware of that and I'm concerned about that. Here's my big concern. My big concern is that you would sit here for 45 minutes hearing about God and leave unchanged. And it's possible. Because to truly know God is not something that primarily or fundamentally happens in your mind. It's something that happens in your heart. And maybe this morning, you're sitting there and you say, you know, I I want to know God. I feel a stirring in my heart that I want to know him and know him more deeply and know him personally as the good God, as the holy God, as the God who is for me, as the God who has saved me. You feel that stirring in your own heart even now as we're talking about it. Well, the really good news is that even that desire is not from you. It's from him. See, God the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart right now and he's wooing you and drawing you to himself. Because however much or however little you want to know God, 
He wants to know you even more. And so he came for you in Jesus, that your sin would be paid for in full, so that you could be reconciled to him. And he's coming to you right now in the person of the Holy Spirit, stirring those desires. What are you going to do with it? Turn to him. Bow your knee to him. And ask that you might be born again and saved. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I pray now, especially for anyone who felt that tugging at their heart, that this faith that you've granted them to desire a new life in Christ, pray that you would do what you do and cause them to be born again, to believe in God, to believe in Jesus that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead for them. Lord, I pray that these convictions about your attributes, your existence, your goodness, and your holiness would shape our lives deeply. We pray this in your name. Amen.